Her situation gets worse. The pain intensifies. If there's a hell, that's probably what it feels like. We don't know what the path is going to be and how bad it would actually get. It definitely crossed my mind that I could be in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. The whole situation was just impossible. Impossible and going nowhere. Next, two medical mysteries that defied the experts. Christina Karras' seemingly ordinary life is shattered when an excruciating headache turns into a freak series of medical catastrophes. While doctors struggle to understand her bizarre symptoms, Christina begins to spiral out of control. The thought of living with it, it wasn't going to happen. That pain was going to kill me. Then, when a bout of dizziness and uncontrollable vomiting hits Bill Cairns, he figures he's come down with a serious case of food poisoning. But below the surface, a strange and deadly condition threatens to tear him limb from limb. I just felt like my body was in total rebellion. OK, Helen, so uh, what we're going to do is get ready uh, for scrubbing first. So tell us what, what you need to do to, to get ready to go to scrub. OK, so uh, what you need to do, as I've already done, is put my eye protection on. Um, I'm opening my gown now, ensuring that I don't touch any of the... Uh, You're just touching the very, very edges of the... my gloves. Now I'm putting my gloves above my gown so I don't then touch them later on. Oh, OK. And then opening that packet, you just... I'm putting my mask on, so uh, I've got to make sure that's very comfortable because it might be on there for a few hours. And tie the top, bottom ties. Twenty-five-year-old Christina Karras had always dreamed of a life on the silver screen. For as long as I can remember, all I ever wanted to be was an actress. Christina just goes after what she wants. She really wanted to live in L.A. After graduating from high school in 2000, she packed her bags and moved to the Hollywood Hills, hoping for her chance at stardom. I was working as a waitress and then going to school and trying to support myself and, and trying to find time for acting in between. She seemed quite happy. And she seemed that she was pursuing and getting close to achieving what she wanted to. But in 2006, shortly after arriving home in New Jersey for Thanksgiving, Christina's entire world begins to spin out of control. I woke up in the middle of the night and I, I was in so much pain that I was screaming and, and my parents woke up. I heard her crying and moaning at about four in the morning and I couldn't figure out why or what was going on. The pain was basically in my right cheekbone area and on the right side of my head and my right ear. It was nothing like I'd experienced, but I, I, I just figured that it was a sinus infection. But the next morning, the excruciating pain hasn't let up a bit. Concerned for their only child, the Karras's immediately schedule an appointment with a nearby doctor. So I'm, I'm sitting in the waiting room, and the fluorescent lights above me are making the pain so much worse that it's probably doubled or tripled in its strength at this point. But after a thorough examination, the doctor assures Christina that her symptoms are nothing to worry about. The doctor told me that it was a sinus infection. She gave me antibiotics and told me that I was totally clear to resume my life as usual. Sure enough, Christina begins feeling better within a few days, and after the holiday, heads back to L.A. So we say goodbye to Christina at the airport and, um, you know, put her on her flight. I mean, everything seemed normal at that point. The first few days that I was back in Los Angeles, I was a little run down um, and not quite myself, but I thought that the antibiotics had worked and I was, I was okay. But just three nights later, Christina wakes up to the worst pain she has ever experienced. I woke up in the middle of the night in excruciating pain, much worse than initially. So my entire face was just in pain on the right side. Christina spends most of the night struggling for relief. She takes several doses of ibuprofen and finally falls asleep just before dawn. And by the time I finally got back to sleep on Sunday morning, I ended up sleeping through my alarm. When I woke up, I, I ran into work. And I was 40 minutes late, and they fired me. Christina is devastated and determined to get some answers right away. 
The next day, I, I went to my doctor in Los Angeles who examined me and told me that he thought I still had a sinus infection, prescribed me more antibiotics, and I asked him why it hurt so bad. And he looked me straight in the face and said that he had seen people with sinus infections in way more pain than me. Despite her frustration with the doctor's assessment, Christina follows orders, taking the antibiotics as prescribed. But after three days, it's clear that the medication is not helping. On the contrary, the pain continues to intensify. The pain had a tremendous effect on my life immediately. I couldn't take care of myself. If you looked at my, my house, my house was a mess. I couldn't keep it up. She called up. She was beside herself. And I said, you know, just come home, just come home. Shocked by her daughter's rapidly deteriorating health, Catherine immediately books her a flight back to New Jersey. It was devastating to see her have to move back with us after she had established herself in Los Angeles. It was like everything she had built just collapsed um, because of this illness. On the flight home, a terrifying new symptom hits Christina. As we were taking off, I realized I was so disgustingly nauseous. And I've never had motion sickness. By sheer force of will, I did not throw up during the takeoff. And during the landing, I wasn't so lucky at all. I was the poor guy sitting next to me. I was that girl that was puking in the barf bag. When I saw her at coming for the baggage claim, I was just in shock. She just was like a little old lady compared to a vibrant young girl, which she had been a week and a half before. And she just collapsed into my arms and we just cried. It was, it was just a horrible sight. Grasping for answers, Christina's father decides to schedule an appointment with a dentist. We went to see if he had to do anything with her teeth or her bite. At this point, my right side of my jaw had completely locked and I could hardly open my mouth at all. The dentist wrote me a prescription for some real painkillers and felt that I was having a TMJ attack and wanted to get me to a TMJ specialist. TMJ refers to the temporomandibular joints, or the jaw joints, which are involved in eating, speaking, and facial movement. We scheduled an appointment with a TMJ doctor, and we were really hoping that, you know, this is what it was and that he had a remedy for it. But on the way to the TMJ specialist, Christina is in utter agony. In the car, I started noticing that, that my sensitivity to everything had increased tenfold. The, the pain pills had stopped working, and being in a car and kind of moving would make me even more nauseous. So I rode the entire way with my head hanging out of the window on a December day to keep from throwing up. And then we went in and he said, well, I can't tell anything. She's in too much pain. I'd like to inject the nerve. He wanted to inject my nerve with Novocaine not inject the area or the muscle, just inject the nerve. And I, and I asked him what, you know, what the risks were. And uh, he told me there were many risks, like I could be permanently paralyzed on that side of my face. And I didn't trust the guy, point blank period. And I got up so fast and hauled my little right out of the office. I stayed behind to talk to the doctor. He said that we should take the pain medication away from her that there may be a chance that she's, number one, exaggerating the pain that she's feeling, and number two, that she's taking more pain medication than she should. My impression, once he said, take away her painkillers, was that he thought she was a drug addict. It made no sense whatsoever. For the last two weeks, 25-year-old Christina Karras has been plagued by excruciating pain and nausea. Disregarded by doctors, the Karras's feel helpless as they watch their only daughter deteriorate before their eyes. Her situation gets worse. The pain intensifies. It felt as though my face was bulging out of the skin. 
I threw up at least once every day. Your day spent mostly in bed. I think 95% of the day was in bed. She would come out, look at us, say a few words, and then go back to bed again. I could hear everything, and it, and it would bother me. Every single light, especially bright light, would just make everything way worse. And the whole situation was just impossible. It was impossible and going nowhere. Catherine begins a desperate search for a doctor capable of unraveling the mystery behind Christina's agonizing symptoms. A colleague recommends a renowned facial pain specialist in New York City, and Catherine immediately schedules an appointment. I went into his office where he has celebrity clients on his walls. He was very confident that I had TMJ and that he was going to fix me. He told me that my jaw was indeed locked on the right side, and the doctor tried to unlock it by injecting Novocaine not in the nerve, but in the area surrounding it and stretching it. Christina had instant relief because it was a local anesthetic. The doctor gave us his cell phone number because he was going to be going away for Christmas, and he sent me home. So we left there very optimistic. Christina was feeling much better. For the first time in three weeks, the pain has subsided, and the Karises breathe a deep sigh of relief. But later that evening, the effects of the Novocaine begin to wear off. We go home, the pain came back. The pain came back. Once that Novocaine wore off, once I was home, it was much worse than it had ever been. I felt so helpless. And Dimitri and I were running out of ideas of things to do, of people to go to. And I just couldn't believe that she couldn't be helped. The Karises begin a desperate search for anyone who can help. But it's Christmas week, and every doctor they call is away for the holiday. I started uh, remembering that people with chronic pain sometimes kill themselves. And uh, I had a lot of compassion for them. And the thought of living with it was an impossibility because it wasn't going to happen. That pain was going to kill me. And just when she thinks it can't get any worse, the unimaginable happens. On New Year's Eve, Christina is terrified when she looks in the mirror and notices that her right eye is drooping to the side. And I looked in the mirror. Now I'm noticing that my, my face is, is really falling apart and, and becoming deformed. By the next morning, the drooping eye is causing double vision and extreme vertigo. My entire vision was completely out of whack to the point where just walking would make me throw up. Right now is what are we going to do to save our child? In a state of panic, the Karises rush Christina to the emergency room at New York City's Cornell Medical Center. And the doctors acted very professionally, took her very seriously. Immediately, the doctors suggest that the problem could be neurological and order an MRI to get a closer look at Christina's brain. Well, nobody prepared Christina for the MRI, and nobody medicated her for the MRI. It was as though there was a construction site inside of my brain, and they were nailing and drilling through my head. And she described it as the worst experience she's ever had in her life. After the MRI, Christina is wheeled back into the ER. The Karises anxiously hold their breath as they wait for the test results. After the test, I had been given some IV morphine, so I was calm. We waited for the reading of the MRI. The doctor came up to us and said that um, the MRI showed a tumor in an area of the brain that they didn't usually operate. I had what he thought was a brain tumor in the cavernous sinus region of my brain where they don't operate. At which point I felt like uh, our life just fell apart. 
After my parents leave for the night, I'm, I'm sitting there in the emergency room by myself. And I think about all the things I haven't done. Twenty-five-year-old Christina Karras has just been told that the painful and mysterious symptoms that have been tearing her life apart for the past month are the result of an inoperable brain tumor. It's late at night, and Christina is alone on a gurney in the ER. At this point, part of me thought that perhaps it was a dream and, and that maybe it was all just a bad dream. I was the only person there to support myself. So I started bargaining with God. I'm praying, and I promised that if he spared me, if he changed my diagnosis, that I would be someone who took their life seriously and, and would enhance the lives of other people. Christina eventually falls asleep at 5 a.m. But a few hours later, she wakes up to a commotion. I was awoken by, I think, seven people around my bed. And um, a man introduced himself to me and, and said he was Dr. Safty, my neurologist. The first time I met Christina, actually, she was, she was in the emergency room. Uh, she was asleep uh, on a stretcher in the emergency room. I came in with my team, which consisted of neurology uh, residents and medical students. Dr. Softy tells Christina that he's had some time to review her MRI. He can definitely see a large lesion in Christina's cavernous sinus cavity, an area in the skull filled with vital veins that deliver blood to the brain. But he's not positive that it's a tumor. Certainly one of the possibilities of when a patient has a lesion in the cavernous sinus is that it could be a brain tumor. It's quite a serious condition because uh, it's really surgically very difficult to access carotid artery runs through the cavernous sinus, multiple nerves run, th run through the cavernous sinus. It's very deep within the brain, so there's a, a lot of risks to operating in that area, um, including stroke, permanent nerve damage, and even uh, seizures or, 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 or death. Exploratory surgery in the cavernous sinus is out of the question, so the only way to verify whether or not the lesion is a tumor is to eliminate all other likely possibilities. You have to make sure the patient doesn't actually have a tumor, and uh, sometimes it's hard to tell. The only other possibility is that the large mass is actually a highly inflamed area of the brain. His first step, treat the area as though it's inflamed. Steroids are our best anti-inflammatory agents, so we treat with steroids and see if the patient improves. If Christina responds favorably to the steroids, it will be clear that she does not have a tumor, but an inflammatory condition that can be treated. Dr. Softy immediately starts her on a high dose of IV steroids. You are waiting to find out whether or not your child is going to live or die, or whether or not she has something that can be taken care of or something that cannot be taken care of. Now, the only thing they can do is wait and see if the medication works. Each hour that passes is excruciating. The next time I saw Christina was the next day, one day after starting intravenous steroids. It worked. Right away. The pain was 60% better. And he told me that uh, what I had was an inflammation and it wasn't a brain tumor. And I felt really grateful and, and overwhelmed with gratitude and it was amazing. She really had absolutely no pain uh, and she really looked a lot better. Her double vision was improving, her eye droop was improving. And it was like a miracle. It was just like a miracle. Christina's constellation of symptoms and her rapid response to the steroids lead Dr. Softy to one firm conclusion. I told her the diagnosis that this probably was not a tumor and probably uh, in Tolosa Hunt syndrome, which is a, a, a benign condition which can be treated. Tolosa Hunt syndrome is a mysterious and extremely rare disorder that inflames the cavernous sinus cavity, inhibiting the function of the cranial nerves that control eye movement, mouth movement, taste, and sight. Tolosa Hunt is a non-life-threatening condition that can be treated with steroids. So the most typical symptoms that patients report are uh, double vision, uh, drooping of the eyelid, 
uh, numbness on the face, and typically the pain is quite severe, and it's always on one side of the head. Um, and all of our symptoms were on the right side because the lesion involved the right cavernous sinus. While Dr. Softy knows what Christina has been suffering from, no one knows exactly what causes Tolosa Hunt syndrome. Tolosa Hunt syndrome is believed to be uh, an, what we term an idiopathic inflammatory disorder, which means it's uh, inflammation of the cavernous sinus for no apparent cause. Uh, nobody really knows what exactly triggers the inflammation, but we do know how to treat it. But why did it take so long to diagnose? First of all, Tolosa Hunt syndrome is a very rare disease, and uh, therefore most physicians uh, probably haven't heard of it since medical school. Um, additionally, Christina was somewhat of an unusual case in that she did have some involvement of uh, the, the, of her chewing muscles, which um, is not very typical. And uh, in Christina's case, it's clear that it was involved in Tolosa Hunt syndrome. After just five months of heavy steroid treatment, Christina Karras's life is finally back to normal. I maintain Christina on um, corticosteroids. By the end of the course of treatment, Christina really appeared as if she never had the disease at all. She looked um, back to normal. She had no headache, she had no double vision. Christina's health now is really good. She's still recuperating, um, but aside from that, her health is good. Christina is thrilled to finally be pain-free, but she's sobered by the thought of what could have happened if Dr. Softy had not made the diagnosis in time. She probably would have continued to get worse uh, and would have developed um, things like permanent double vision uh, and um, a disfigurement of her face if she hadn't been treated. It's, it's quite possible. Christina's close brush with permanent nerve damage has left her determined to hold up her end of the bargain she made with God. My plans for the future have changed a little. I made a little promise while I was in the emergency room um, to God, and he came through on his deal. So I'm actually going to go to nursing school to pay back to the world in a tangible way. In the summer of 1995, the 25-year-old is in the best shape of his life and has a grueling job at a warehouse near his Long Island home. All day long, I was lifting heavy boxes, um, climbing shelves, putting boxes away. It was a uh, fastener company. Um, we both actually worked there at the time. Bill pulled his weight at work. He did his job well. After one particularly hard day at the warehouse, Bill's friend Daryl invites a few of the guys from work over for dinner. I believe what Daryl made that night was chicken parmesan. How do you make chicken parmesan? Sauce, chicken sauce, cheese, bread it. That was basically it. After dinner, the guys get caught up in a baseball game. But soon, Bill is overcome by a bizarre sensation. I started to feel a little strange. I started to sweat. I started to feel a little bit dizzy, disoriented. But I figured it would pass. But it doesn't pass, and Bill quickly realizes he's going to be very sick at his friend's house. I felt embarrassed to be feeling this bad in front of my friends. I don't know if it's my stomach or if it's just stress from lifting boxes all day. And I went in the bathroom and I basically just sat down and tried to orient myself. The room was spinning, I was sweating, my heart was racing. Bill is too disoriented to drive and asks a friend to take him home. I've never had a heart attack, but I imagine that one is what one would feel like. But I, I figured, you know, I can't be having a heart attack. I'm only 25. Shortly after a meal at a friend's dinner party, 25-year-old Bill Cairns is suddenly overwhelmed by a mysterious episode of dizziness and exhaustion. That night, Bill hopes to sleep it off, but the next day, he can barely make it out of bed to call in sick to work. I told them I feel like I have a flu or a stomach virus, and I would try to come in later if I could, but I didn't think I'd be able to. Bill sleeps all day, hoping that he'll be OK to go to a concert that night. We were going to a concert to see REM. We had seven throw at Madison Square Garden, so I was determined to go to that concert. Bill forces himself out of bed and meets Daryl at the train station. On the way into New York City, Daryl notices a dramatic change in his friend's appearance. Bill was looking pale once we got up to the train. I just didn't feel well at all. I felt so disoriented, so dizzy, and 
I felt trapped in a railroad car that you can't get out of, you can't stop. Daryl brought it up. He thought, you think it was my chicken last night? And I said, well, no one else is sick. You're not sick. So we kind of laughed it off as a joke that it might have been the chicken. Bill can barely keep it together during the concert. And as soon as the show ends, he takes a turn for the worse. I started vomiting after the concert. It got pretty bad. Even though I wasn't eating anything, I was still vomiting. By the next morning, the vomiting is out of control. Anytime I tried to eat anything, I would vomit within a half hour. I couldn't keep any food down. I tried to eat the blandest things, but they wouldn't stay down. So I, I spent the days bedridden and just wondering when this was going to end. The next week is brutal, and Bill's condition doesn't improve. The weight was just flying off of me. When I weighed myself, I would be at least five pounds lighter. Uh, sometimes there was a, a 10 pound difference between one day and the next. When Bill's family comes to check in on him that week, they're stunned by his appearance. There was a drastic drop in Bill's weight and his, his, the way he looked, his, his whole attitude, his whole demeanor. I was about 190 before the concert and I was around 160, 150 by the end of the week. I couldn't stop vomiting. I just felt like my body was in total rebellion. Bill's weight loss is nothing short of shocking. In 10 days, he's lost more than 30 pounds. The family had mentioned to him to maybe he should seek the doctor or medical attention, and he thought that it would just pass, that it would be food poisoning, and it would just run its course. I don't necessarily like doctor's visits, so I was doing my best to avoid it. Bill refuses to see a doctor, even though he's bedridden and unable to work. And it just became too, too much for him. He couldn't function at work. He couldn't do his job. He didn't have the strength to lift anymore. Then, nearly two weeks after his first episode, a new symptom emerges. It just felt like my legs had gone to sleep. It started in my feet and worked its way up. It felt like tiny little pinpricks, like you've slept on your leg too long. It was like pins and needles, but it was getting more painful than pins and needles. This led me to think, OK, something else is going on here. Frightened by the tingling in his legs, Bill finally realizes that he's not suffering from some garden variety food poisoning. He needs help fast. I've come to the point where I have to admit it. This isn't going away. This is something that needs treatment. He musters enough strength to drive himself to the ER. And when doctors finally examine him, they're alarmed by his dramatic weight loss. The doctors pulled up my shirt, noticed I had stretch marks from losing so much weight so rapidly. And I told them I had lost at least 30 pounds in about the last 10 days. The ER doctors are confident that Bill's suffering from an acute case of gastroenteritis, an infection of the gastrointestinal tract. I remember. In the ER, the first thing they did was hook me up to IV fluids to get some fluids back into me. And then they ordered a CAT scan of my stomach area. But the CAT scan comes back normal. The ER doctors are baffled. They hadn't been able to stop the vomiting. They hadn't been able to stop the dizziness or the sweating. Usually when you go to an ER, they can pinpoint right away what's wrong with you. So not knowing was, was very upsetting to me. Stumped for a diagnosis, the doctors immediately admit Bill for observation. It was frightening, uh, not knowing what was really going to happen with Bill. We didn't know how bad his condition was going to get. Over the next couple of days in the hospital, the tingling in my legs actually started to get a little worse. And I started to notice it more and more. The pain started to increase, and it started to feel like very bad muscle cramps up and down my leg into my calf. I needed help to just cross the hospital room because my legs hurt so much, and they felt very weak. They believed that it was just a symptom of the vomiting and being bedridden. They weren't too concerned about 
my legs at that point. After seven days in the hospital, doctors still don't know what's causing the chronic vomiting and crippling leg pain. Bill is extremely frustrated and totally unprepared for what happens next. One night, he's alone in his room when a massive storm knocks the power out. During the storm, the hospital lost their electricity. So most of the lights were out. The main hospital instruments were still running on generators, but most of the rooms were out, the hallways were out. So the room was pretty much dark. Totally alone, Bill lies in bed for what seems like hours, but soon he needs to use the bathroom. And I had been having assistance at that point going to the bathroom because I felt I wouldn't be able to call anyone. I decided to, that I would just use the urinal myself. So I got out of bed, I stood up, and that's when my legs gave out, and I fell right to the floor. All the IVs popped out of my arm. I pulled them all out, and I just collapsed on the floor. I tried to get up. I tried to just pull myself up on the bed. But it was apparent that my legs weren't working at all. Hospital staff has spent the last seven days trying to diagnose Bill Cairn's bizarre gastrointestinal symptoms when suddenly the unthinkable happens. During a hospital-wide blackout, Bill's legs give out and he collapses onto the floor. With my arms, I dragged myself into the hallway where there was a little bit of light and I called for the nurse. I was actually lying in the hallway for a few minutes, bleeding from the, where the IVs came out. Nurses find Bill on the floor and immediately get him safely back in bed. When they put me back into bed, I was terrified. I, my legs weren't working at all. Bill eventually manages to get back to sleep, hoping the whole episode was just a result of extreme fatigue. When I woke up, I was in bed, I looked down at my feet, and I determined to try and move my toes to see if that was just a freak accident the night before. And I looked down at my toes, and I basically just thought, okay, move, and nothing happened. It's Bill's worst nightmare. He can't understand how he could go from having the flu to not being able to walk in just two weeks. Feeling pain in your legs, you know, all right, they can give me something to, to relieve the pain. But feeling nothing, touching your leg and not being able to feel it was, was much worse. Walking into his hospital room and seeing him like that was very tough. I just felt horrible watching him go through this and, you know, deteriorate the way he was deteriorating. It was, it was very frightening and very upsetting. Perplexed by the sudden onset of paralysis, the medical team orders an MRI of Bill's chest and spine. But the test results mystify them. The MRI showed basically that I was healthy except for being paralyzed. I was great, you know, too bad I, I can't walk. After a week of intense observation and tests, doctors are still no closer to an answer. The next day, Bill is transferred to the intensive care unit. That's when neurologist John Kellerman is called in. Just by meeting him at first, for some reason, I had that feeling that, OK, maybe now I'll find out what's wrong. Something was happening that was changing his body. A, a previously healthy young man who suddenly was completely incapacitated by an illness and then paralysis. And so as a neurologist, you kind of march your mind through the entire nervous system. Dr. Kellerman begins by testing Bill's reflexes. One of the first things he did was a reflex test, which is the basic hammer to the knee, and your knee kicks out, and nothing happened. My legs just stayed there. My conclusion was that something uh, at, in that reflex pathway was abnormal and not functioning normally, and that the problem had to do with the nerves coming out of his spinal cord. And the next thing that I did was perform nerve conduction testing and electromyography. An electromyography, or EMG, test will determine whether the nerves in Bill's legs are functioning properly. 
On my legs during the test, I really couldn't feel anything. And that actually made him very concerned. His nerves were clearly not carrying the electricity that I gave him normally. There was uh, something causing an abnormality of the uh, nerve conductions in his, uh, in his legs. The next step is to do a spinal tap. During a spinal tap, a long needle is carefully inserted directly into the space between two of the lower vertebrae, enabling doctors to collect a small amount of cerebrospinal fluid. The worst part was being awake and knowing what they were doing to my spine. It takes one hour for the results to come in. Bill anxiously waits, praying that doctors will at last be able to figure out what's causing his body to shut down. And when the results come back, Dr. Kellerman finally has the piece of the puzzle he's been looking for. The spinal fluid came back showing that there was elevated protein and little or no white blood cells. And that, that's a, a, a fairly characteristic picture in Guillain-Barre. Guillain-Barre syndrome is an extremely rare and devastating disorder where the body's immune system mistakenly attacks the nerve cells within the nervous system, causing muscle weakness, paralysis, and in some cases, death. The exact cause of Guillain-Barre is unknown, but a minor infection in the respiratory or gastrointestinal systems can trigger it without any warning. The disease seems to start in the legs, the feet, and then kind of travels up uh, up the leg and eventually throughout the body, throughout the nervous system. In fact, for a long time, uh, one of the names of Guillain-Barre syndrome was ascending paralysis, a paralysis that climbs up. Now the clock is ticking. If Dr. Kellerman doesn't stop the disease immediately, Bill could become completely paralyzed. That was really scary to learn that it could actually go up your entire body, that it could affect your lungs, that it could affect your throat, that you could not be able to talk, not be able to breathe on your own. The ominous part of his disease was the involvement of the nerves that control his organs and particularly his heart. Dr. Kellerman finds himself in a race against time to save Bill. You can liken an autoimmune disease like Guillain-Barre to a brush fire. And you want to hit that brush fire fast and hard and stop it in his tracks before more trees are burned. He puts him on an immunoglobulin treatment, or IVIG therapy. Millions of healthy antibodies are injected into Bill's immune system in the hope that they will bind with the attacking antibodies and shut them down. In essence, the good cells will neutralize the bad ones. But Dr. Kellerman can't guarantee that the immunotherapy will stop the disease from progressing further. For Bill and his family, the next few days are excruciating. We have a diagnosis, but we don't know what the path is going to be, how long it would take, how long, how much more he would be paralyzed, and how bad it would actually get. Bill Cairns has just been diagnosed with Guillain-Barre syndrome, an extremely rare and deadly disease which can completely incapacitate its victim. Bill has been put on an intense regimen of immunotherapy to try to stop the paralysis, which has already crippled his legs, from spreading throughout the rest of his body. For Bill, waiting for the procedure to take effect is unbearable. It wasn't a relief to find out that it was Guillain Barre because of the possibility of total paralysis. Uh, that was a very real possibility and a very terrifying possibility. It was clear that there was a fairly aggressive process going on that, if not stopped, could totally destroy his peripheral nerves and leave him permanently paralyzed. I didn't notice any difference until by about the third day. They started to become a little bit more confident that the paralysis would be confined just to my waist down, that it wouldn't progress any further. While the team appears to have stopped the paralysis in its tracks, the entire episode has taken an incredible toll on Bill's body. Unable to walk, Bill is almost completely incapacitated. Dr. Kellerman sends him to a rehab facility with the hope that he may someday walk again. Dr. Kellerman said uh, it would be a very long and time-consuming task. Yeah, it definitely crossed my mind that I could be in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. For the next year, a very determined Bill Cairns is focused on one thing, learning to walk. I had gone over a progression of wheelchairs to crutches and braces and different things. 
very, very slowly, I was starting to get some feeling back in my legs. Nerves can regrow. Many people don't realize that. The, the nervous system has to be reinforced by constantly doing that activity. Otherwise, it literally forgets. And then finally, there came a day where I was going to walk across my kitchen without anything, just walk across. I made it across the, the kitchen floor, and it was, it was a tremendous feeling for me. And sure enough, he got up and he started to walk. Now he was walking without any help. He'd take a few steps, he was fine, and everybody was very excited. It was an amazing feeling just seeing him be able to use his legs and walk without assistance and be close to the person he was again was fantastic. Bill knows he is extremely lucky to have survived Guillain-Barre. Diagnosis is often difficult because the disease frequently follows an infection. So in treating the minor infection, the serious nature of Guillain-Barre is not evident. Well, I, I think the other doctors rightfully in the beginning were focused on his gastrointestinal complaints. And, and certainly that was the most dramatic part of his early, early illness. And when you're focused on one system, it's, it's oftentimes difficult to recognize something brewing underneath another very dramatic medical situation. While the true cause of Guillain-Barre is unknown, doctors often see a link between certain bacteria and the illness. There is a bacterium that can be found in chicken, particularly uh, uncooked or poorly cooked chicken, called Campylobacter jejuni. And it's felt to be one of the organisms that can lead to this misinterpretation by the immune system. And this bacterium is implicated and seems to be present in a, in a very large number of Guillain-Barre cases. While it's impossible to say for sure, doctors speculate that a piece of Daryl's chicken parmesan was contaminated with the bacterium. Did I expect somebody to get sick from my food? No. Did I expect somebody to get that sick? Definitely not. Bill has not eaten at my house since, uh, though I've tried to coax him into it. After an intense year-long physical therapy process, Bill finally returns to work. When I came back to my job, I really wasn't able to work in the warehouse anymore. So I was put into the office, into sales. It's definitely a lot better than, than lifting 90-pound rivet boxes all day. <laughs> <laughs>